In this video, we're going to look at another example of using the derivative to give us characteristics of the original function that we have. So this is the function that we're dealing with, given to us right here, f of x equals this thing that we got going on here. And we're going to answer the same questions that we answered in the first video for this section. And we're going to kind of use the same attack process because all of this information that we're looking at comes from the first derivative in some form or fashion, but what we need to focus on for the most part is the critical points. After we get to that, it's relatively smooth sailing, but first we need to establish what our critical points of this function are. In order to do that, we got to find out where the derivative equals zero or is undefined. So let's take the derivative. And we see that we have a function here multiplied by another function, okay? And so what rule do we commonly use when doing something like this, when we have two functions multiplied by each other? We use the product rule. So let's call this function g and this function h, okay? So here we're going to have that g equals x squared minus 3 over 25. g prime is going to be the derivative of this with respect to x. So we're going to take the power rule of each term. So we get 2x, and that's our derivative because it's a constant. It evaluates 0. And then h is e to the 5x. Well, how do we take the derivative of e to the 5x? Well, we see that this function, e to the something, has a function inside of its something, we'll call it, with not using mathematically correct language, but we have a function inside of the power of our exponential function here. So in order to take the derivative of that, we've got to use the chain rule. So here we get e to that something, and then that something is 5x, right? So now let's take the derivative of each of these. Well, the derivative of e to something is e to that same something, right? But then what we have to do is multiply it by the derivative of that power. So the derivative of the power is 5. So our derivative for this is 5e to the 5x. And this is our h prime. Okay? And so now what we were doing when we've taken all these derivatives is we we're using the product rule to figure out what the derivative of our original function was, right? So f prime of x is going to follow g times h prime plus h times g prime. So let's write that out. So here we have 5e to the 5x times x squared minus 3 over 25. And then we add g prime times h, which is 2x e to the 5x. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to distribute this 5e to the 5x into this parentheses here just to make it easier on myself. So here what we're going to get is 5x squared e to the 5x minus, and then if we multiply 5 times negative 3 over 25. 5 is going to divide away, but then we can also divide this into 25 five times, right? So what this is actually going to become is we're going to get minus 3 over 5 e to the 5x plus 2x e to the 5x. And so now the reason I did that was now we can more plainly see that each term, and I call a term something that's separated by a subtraction or addition symbol. So we have this term, this term, and this term, we see that each one of them has an e to the 5x in common, right? So when that happens, we can factor that out. So we have e to the 5x times 5x squared minus 3 fifths plus 2x. And this is our derivative. So we have f prime of x. Okay, so we're all good there so far. And again, similarly to last video, this derivative function is going to be defined for all of our x. So all we really need to find is where f prime of x equals zero, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set this derivative equal to zero and use the zero product property again to figure out what makes each individual factor equal to zero. So here what we're gonna get is zero equals e to the five x times five x squared minus three fifths plus two x. And so what that does, again, by using the zero product property, we can set each individual factor equal to zero and solve for x individually. So here we get zero equals e to the five x and five x squared minus three fifths plus two x equals zero. So it felt a little weird writing e to the five x equals zero because we talked about it, I believe it was last section, where how this really doesn't have a solution. There's no x value that we can plug in to e to the five times that x value to return zero because by the nature of this exponential function, let me just give you a rough sketch of what e to the 5x looks like. It's going to be something that looks kind of like this. It's going to, as we grow large in the negative direction, it's going to go closer and closer to the x-axis, yeah, 
where y equals zero, but it's never actually going to be it. We talked about it with limits how about how this approaches zero, but it never actually becomes zero. So what we're gonna get is there no, there's no such x value that makes this statement true, so there's no solution to worry about there. But now we need to worry about what x value makes this statement true, or x values in some cases maybe. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite this into the standard form for a quadratic because since this is dealing with a fraction in the C term spot, I really don't feel comfortable in my ability to factor this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the quadratic formula to figure out the roots of this or the spots where, where if we plug in X, we evaluate to be zero. So what we're gonna have is we're gonna have negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared, which evaluates to four, minus four times A times C that's going to be a negative three-fifths. Let me get that square root in there. All over two times a, which is 10. So now what this gives us is that five and then divided by five will divide away. So we get negative four times negative three. So what that radicand becomes is four plus 12, right? Because minus four times negative three is plus 12. Four plus 12 is 16. So we get negative two plus or minus root 16 over 10. So what we're dealing with is negative two plus or minus four over 10. And what that tells us is that if we add, if we do negative two plus four, we're gonna get two over 10 or one fifth. And then if we subtract four, we're also gonna get an X value of negative two minus four which is negative six over 10 or negative three over five. So here we have that X equals one fifth and x equals negative three-fifths are our critical points because these are the spots that made the quadratic factor of our original derivative equal to zero. So just like last question, what I'm going to do now is write a number line kind of depicting the situation that we're living in here, and we're going to use the critical points that we found to figure out what's going on with our uh, derivative and where the function is going to be increasing, decreasing, where we have the local max, local min, all that kind of good stuff. So I use zero as a divider between the negatives and the positives. So here, let's create some space. Like, let's just kind of say for imagination shape, this is one fifth right here. And then we also have to put down negative three fifths. So again, I just put dots around my critical points so I don't lose sight of what my critical points are. So now, the intervals that we have are negative infinity to negative three fifths. And these are all gonna be open intervals, just like last time. Then we also have negative three fifths to one fifth. And then we have, lastly, one fifth to infinity. So what we're gonna look at now is values that we can plug in to our derivative inside of this interval to use to evaluate the sign of our derivative, because once we know what the, whether the derivative is positive or negative, that'll tell us that the function's increasing or decreasing. So here I'm gonna pick something like negative one. Again, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel as far as picking values go. We're trying to make it simpler on ourselves so we can focus on the bigger picture. And then a value inside of negative three-fifths and one-fifths, hey, let's use zero, that works. And then actually I'm gonna erase the negative infinity, that shouldn't be there. So then we get one fifth to infinity. Let's pick the value one, right? Just keep them simple. So here we're gonna evaluate f prime of negative one. Here we're gonna evaluate f prime of zero. Here we're gonna evaluate f prime of one. Okay, and before we get into evaluating these things, I wanna go back to our derivative and look at something real quick. So our derivative is given to us by e to the five x times this quadratic, right? Well, when we look at e to the five x, this will always give us a positive value, right? Because if we graph e to the five x, or even if we plug in a negative power, so let's imagine this is e to the five x before I lose my train of thought. But if it has a negative sign, all it's really gonna end up happening is we're gonna flip that over the y axis because we have a negative impacting what happened with the x. So let's say this is e to the negative five x, okay? So if we were to get a negative value for our x, the values of our entire exponential function will always return positive and they'll never be negative. The only way that an exponential function like e to the five x could return negative values if it was negative e 
to the 5x. This would give us negative values, but that's not what we're concerned with. We're concerned with the cases of either e to the 5x or e to the negative 5x. And in either case, all these values will live above the x-axis, so they'll always be positive. So instead of having to worry about evaluating values inside of e to the 5x, when we're talking about evaluating the derivative, let's just go ahead and worry about what the quadratic will do to those different values and how that will return the different signs, because that's going to be the more important sign that we have to pay attention to anyways, because if we have a positive times a positive, it's still going to be positive. But if we get a positive times a negative, it's going to tell us our derivative is negative, so our function is decreasing. So all we really need to worry about is plugging in those x values that we found into our quadratic here, and that'll tell us the sign of our derivative, and it'll also tell us what happens with the function on those different intervals. Okay, so if we have f prime of negative 1, what we're going to get is something that looks like 5 minus 3 fifths minus 2. And this evaluates to give us something along the lines of 12 fifths, right? Because if we do 5 minus 2, we get 3. And 3 minus 3 fifths is still going to be a positive number, right? That's what we're more concerned with. So since this is a positive value, it tells us that on this interval negative infinity to negative 3 fifths, f is increasing. Okay? What about f prime of 0? When we evaluate f prime of 0, we get 0 minus 3 fifths minus 0, or negative 3 fifths, right? Well, keyword there is negative. So since we got a derivative that was negative, it tells us that our function is decreasing on this interval. What about f prime of 1? f prime of 1 returns as f minus 3 fifths plus 2. And so what this evaluates to be is 7 minus 3 fifths, or something along the lines of 32 over 5 that we get there. And so we get that this is positive. And so this tells us that f is increasing. So at this point, we know what intervals f is increasing on and what interval f is decreasing on. So we've answered the third part of the question. But now we need to figure out where the local max and local min occurs. Well, remember how I said last video that if we go from increasing to decreasing on intervals next to each other, and we go from decreasing to increasing, what happens there? Well, if we go from increasing to decreasing, we get a local max at that, at that critical point value, right? So we have a local max here occurring at x equals negative 3 fifths. Similarly, but in the opposite context, we go from decreasing to increasing. So this gives us a local min at x equals 1 fifth. Okay, so we know where our max and min values occur. We just need to now figure out what those max and min values are. And so what web work went ahead and did is they didn't necessarily go through and evaluate the decimal answers that your function will return by plugging these in. Because if we evaluate f of negative 3 fifths and f of 1 fifth, I'll kind of show you what those look like. We'll get negative 3 fifths squared minus 3 over 25 and then times e to the 5 times negative 3 fifths and then for this we'll get 1 fifth squared minus 3 over 25 times e to the 5 times 1 fifth. So then what this will work out to be is if we plug this in the calculator, we will get some decimal answers. But instead, what they went ahead and did and chose to represent their answers as, you can plug these into the calculator. That'll give you the answer. And it'll as long as you use the right amount of decimal places, it'll give you correct credit for the answer. But I want to show you how they got their answer as well. So you're not kind of confused on where those came from. Largely, what it was was a lot of different rules involving exponents and the different rules that we have. So I'm going to work kind of both of them simultaneously because they work largely in the same way. So when we have e to the 5 times this other power that's a fraction, 5 and divided by 5 divide away in both cases. So here all we're left with is e to the negative 3, and all here is what we're left with is e to the 1. But now let's evaluate this square inside of here. So we get negative 3 fifths squared evaluates to 9 over 25, and this is minus... Oh, that was horrible. This is supposed to be minus 3 over 25. So we get minus 3 over 25 times e to the negative 3. And then this is going to give us 1 over 25 minus 3 over 25 times e. 
Okay, so now doing some subtraction of fractions, we get that 9 over 25 minus 3 over 25 gives us 6 over 25e e to the negative 3. So this is going to be our value for our local max right there. And this is going to be 1 over 25 minus 3 over 25 gives us negative 2, 25 times e. And this will be the value for our local min right here. So like I said, if you use these and plug them in the calculator right off the bat, you can do that. And as long as you use the right amount of decimal places, it'll give you the correct answer. But this is what will pop up inside of WebWorks, something that looks more closely to this type of thing going on right here. Okay, so again, we looked at another example of using the derivative of our function to tell us different attributes of our original function, and more importantly about its graph, so that we don't really have to go through and graph it by a point plotting method. We can use the derivative to tell us a lot of the things that we need to know in order to get the general curvature of the graph down, and that's what we're doing. In the next video, what we're going to look at is we're going to take this a step further, and not necessarily looking at increasing and decreasing intervals in local max and local mins, but we're going to look at points of inflections and concavity of our uh, function based on the second derivative this time instead of just our first derivative.